Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CircuitPython Weekly for December 5th, 2022. This is the time of the week where we all get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Katni, and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. CircuitPython is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. Its development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you'd like to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dash dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it coincides with a U.S. holiday. In the notes doc, there's a link to a calendar that you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. If you'd like to receive those notifications, please ask us to add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. There is a notes doc to accompany the meeting and recording. The notes doc contains timestamps to go along with the video, so you can use the doc to view only the parts of the video that interest you most. It tends to run 45 to 60 minutes, so this gives you the option to skip around. After each meeting, we post a link to the next meeting's notes document in the CircuitPython-dev channel on the Adafruit Discord server. Check the pinned messages to find the latest notes doc so you can add your notes for the following meeting. If you wish to participate but cannot attend, you can leave hug reports and status updates in the document for us to read during the meeting. The meeting is held in five parts. The first part is community news, which is a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. The second part is the state of CircuitPython libraries and Blinka. This is a statistical overview of the entire project and a chance to look at the project by the numbers. Next up is hug reports, which is the first of two round robins. It's an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing, taking the time to recognize awesome folks in our community. The fourth part is status updates, the second round robin. Status updates is an opportunity to sync up on what we've been up to. Take a couple minutes to talk about what you've been doing in the last week since the last meeting and you'll, uh, what you'll be up to over the next week until the next meeting. The fifth and final part is in the weeds. Uh, this is uh, for more long form discussions that may come out of status updates or be something you've identified ahead of time is too long for status updates. And that covers how the meeting will go. I will make a note um, regarding the meeting times um, please look into it for the holidays. Uh, we are not going to be holding a meeting uh, between Christmas and New Year's, and um, we may be moving a meeting or two to Tuesdays, and the calendar will be accurate, and we will be sure to let you know uh, the week before. But if you're interested in finding that out now, you can check out the calendar. And with that, I will get started with community news. Uh, first up, 100 CircuitPython Blinka compatible single board computers. Uh, so Blinka brings CircuitPython APIs and therefore CircuitPython libraries to single board computers. It's a pip installable Python library that runs on normal desktop Python. Uh, the CircuitPython runtime isn't used. CircuitPython libraries can also be installed via pip. Uh, the number of boards that support Blinka is now 100. If you're interested, check out the guide um, or there's a blog post also linked in the notes document. The uh, project of the week was a Hanukkah lightsaber. Uh, a Hanukkah persistence of light lightsaber. And this is a quote from the uh, author. Toward the Jewish month Kislev, the month of light, I built a Hanukkah lightsaber prop based on a maker's project from the Adafruit company. Besides building the hardware, I made necessary adjustments for the Hanukkah holiday. 30 colored RGB NeoPixel LEDs are connected to an Adafruit Circuit Playground board responsible for processing a bitmap image, divided into columns, and when deflected the lightsaber er, and exposed to a camera with a slow exposure, you'll get an image floating in space without the person even deflecting the lightsaber. Happy holidays full of light to everyone, and there's a link to Instagram there. And finally, uh, Pico Touch Synth. This is a quote uh, from Toddbot on Mastodon. First light on PicoTouch synth and the CapSense pads work better than the PicoTouch board. Uh, the reverse mount NeoPixel LEDs are totally awesome. The test code is in CircuitPython. Uh, so that has been uh, community news. It is uh, pulled from our CircuitPython weekly newsletter, which is a community-run newsletter emailed every Tuesday. The complete archives are available on adafruitdaily.com. 
uh, at adafruitdaily.com slash category slash CircuitPython. Highlights all the latest Python on hardware-related news, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. To contribute your own news or project, you can edit next week's draft on GitHub and submit a pull request. Um, you can also tag a tweet or a toot uh, to with Circuit Python on Twitter or Mastodon, respectively, or email cpnews at adafruit.com. And that is community news. Next up, the state of Circuit Python, the libraries, and Blinka. This is a statistical overview of the entire project, and it gives us a chance to look at the project by the numbers. Uh, this this report contains information from the previous seven days. Any changes made today will not be included. So uh, first up, overall, um, there were 98 pull requests merged uh, by 20 different authors. A few that I don't recognize are Nisen, uh, Jay Shimbo, P. Kowalski, uh, Kenneth Ryerson, and E. Carazzo. Um, thanks to everybody who contributed uh, and welcome to our new authors. And we had 11 reviewers. We had 40 issues closed by 13 people and 20 opened by 13 people. So next, uh, Scott will talk about the core, then I will talk about the libraries, and Melissa will talk about Blinka. So, Scott, Thanks, go Katni. Mm -hmm. uh, state of the core, uh, 27 pull requests merged, which is awesome. Uh, we had 11 different authors. Some new names to me um, might not be the very first time, but uh, newish to me. Uh, Jay Shimbo, Pixel Clay, Bill 88T, and Bablock B. Um, thanks to all those folks for being relatively new authors of PRs. Uh, we had four reviewers. Uh, thanks to Mike Wadev, who's a reviewer off and on. Um, we had 22 open pull requests as, as of last night. Um, we have three of them that are 150 plus days old. Um, and I think this number is down thanks to Dan for closing some that didn't seem to be progressing at all. Uh, Issues-wise, we have 18 closed issues by five people and 12 opened by seven people, so we're net down six, which is great. Um, and there's a lot of people involved, which is also really awesome. Uh, we have 577 open issues. Uh, we have, uh, this says 24 open issues on 8.0, but we just did a pass, so it's now 18, um, which is good. We have uh, 504 long-term issues and two issues not assigned to Milestone as of last night. So um, doing pretty good. We are still slowly growing in issue count, but largely in that long-term category, uh, which is to be expected. Um, and that's it for the core. Thanks, Scott. Mm -hmm. Next up, the libraries. So cross, this applies to all the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries, which is everything that starts with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, as well as a few extras, such as the community bundle and um, our cookie cutter. So across all those repositories, I had 64 pull requests merged um, by six different authors and seven reviewers. Uh, we closed out two over two weeks old. One of them was 91 days old. That's excellent. Uh, a majority of them were nine days old. These were all filed for um, a uh, <clears throat> update across all the libraries, um, which is why the open pull requests from the last meeting was so high, and that's why it's down now. Um, is uh, and we have, that leaves us with thirty nine open pull requests, which is uh, much closer to our usual number. We had nineteen issues closed by nine people and six open by six people, leaving us with five hundred and eighty five open issues. 97 of those are good first issues. If you're interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, check out circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all of this information and more, including an actual list of the open pull requests and a list of open issues. If you're new to everything, check out good first issues. Those are a great place to start. Um, if you want to get involved with reviewing, take a look at the open pull requests. If you have the hardware, test it. If you don't, uh, take a look for code syntax spelling, that sort of thing. Leave us a comment and let us know you did that. And once you're comfortable with that, we can talk about leveling you up to the review team. Uh, so next up is uh, Library PyPI Weekly Download Stats. Um, across all of the libraries on PyPI, we had uh, 195,955 downloads. And uh, the list of the top 10 libraries uh, from the past week 
by downloads is listed in the notes doc. One thing that is a little interesting this week that I haven't seen since we got back into tracking this is that everyone on the every single library on the top 10 list is over a thousand downloads. Typically that's not the case. So there's been a lot of downloading in the last week. Um, library updates in the last seven days. Uh, there was a, one new library, Adafruit Circuit Python Pixel Map, and uh, way too many updated libraries to list. So that was uh, truncated. And that's what I've got. Next up is Melissa to talk about Blinka. Hello. So Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for MicroPython and single board computers such as the Raspberry Pi. Uh, this week we had seven pull requests merged by five authors and two reviewers. And there are currently seven open pull requests. Uh, there were three closed issues by one person and two open by one person, uh, leaving a net of 86 open issues. There were 33,616 PyPI downloads in last week, and there were 7,007 PyWheels downloads in the last month, and we are now at 100 boards. Right. And that's it. Thanks, Melissa. <laughs> Thanks. All right, next up is Hug Reports. Uh, Hug Reports is the first of our two round robins, uh, where I will start and then I will go through the list. I will read off notes for folks that are participating but not uh, able to speak, and I will call on folks that are able to speak to read their own. Um, this is an opportunity for us to call out the great things that folks are up to in the community and um, just generally uh, point out positivity. Um, so I will start and then I will head down the list. The next two will be uh, people that I read off. Uh, hug report to Tectric for making Adabot happy and getting the library report running again. To Noah for designing the stand for my upcoming project guide and shipping me a printed copy. To Liz for being an amazing collaborator, for being incredibly helpful and supportive, and an all-around great person. Uh, I didn't keep track of anything last week, apparently. Um, if I missed you, it wasn't intentional, and a group hug for everyone. Next up is notes from Anecdata, who has a hug report for Naradoc for figuring out the multi-device nature of the MDNS hostname issue. Uh, next up is C. Grover, who's text-only. A hug report to Foamy Guy for always informative streams and patience with my questions. And a group hug. Next up is Dan. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks to Spavlot in Discord for, and then in um, GitHub for debugging and then submitting a PR. There was a confusing HTTP server issue, um, which we tracked down to um, a dictionary being passed in and having being modified when it shouldn't have been. And that was, so that was, a bunch of us worked on this and we figured it out together. Thanks to uh, Bab Lock. B uh, in GitHub for GitHub code spaces support for the circuit Python repo. I don't exactly understand this, but it sounds very interesting and I'm interested in trying it. Thanks to Bill ADAT for the PR for Pico W uh, access point support. A bunch of people are trying that already. And thanks to Jeff and Scott. We, uh, after our 1 p.m. internal meeting, we had a very short 800 bug triage meeting again and managed to reduce the number of 800 bugs. So that's good. Okay. All right. Uh, next up is DJ Devon 3, but I do not see them, so I will read it off. Um, hug to everyone who agreed to receive a TR cowbell and provide feedback. To John Park, Foamy Guy, and Reese Brothers for their streams, I learned something new every stream. And a group hug. Next up is Foamy Guy. All right, thanks, Katni. Um, first hug report uh, this week, thank you to Scott for providing thorough review and feedback on the display IO change that I made inside the core. I uh, learned a lot about both display IO and more generally just how the core works, how to do stuff inside of it. Um, so that was good, definitely appreciate that. Um, thank you to everyone who's been discussing and sharing ideas about .env or more generally the way that we store secret information. I think it's a good discussion to be having. Um, even though it may be uh, difficult to figure out what's the best path forward, I think it's good to get it nailed down. So thanks to everyone for being involved. 
Um, and then lastly, this week for me, thanks to Johnny Bergdahl for putting me in touch with the Simple Electronics podcast folks. Uh, may appear on a future episode of that uh, podcast. So thanks. Excellent. Next up is Jeff. All right. Um, basically, I appreciate people sitting down and talking to me and working stuff through. So uh, Katni, you and Dan and I had a good discussion last week. Uh, Dan and Scott and I had another useful discussion just before this meeting where we walked through some stuff um, about issues I was working on as well as the uh, whole ADO backlog. And then uh, Dan and Scott in particular uh, for working together and finding a way forward from .env. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, and to Bill ADAT for the pull request that implements access point on Pico W. Um, really appreciate your work on that one. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Next up, I've got notes from Keith, the EE, a uh, hug report to myself for a wonderful write-up about what to expect when teaching CircuitPython to folks with a programming background who might not have experience with electronics, and a hug for the community as a whole for always being awesome. Next up is Melissa. Uh, hello. Uh, so I wanted to give a hug to everyone who contributed to us getting to 100 Blinka boards. Uh, to Katni for quickly merging a PR that brought uh, that showed that we had the 100 boards in the stickupython.org and a group hugged everyone else. Thanks. All right. Uh, next up, I have notes from Tammy Makes Things, uh, who gives me a hug report for hosting the meeting and a group hug. Next up is Scott. Good morning. Um, first, a hug to Boolean Matic for fixing. Uh, an issue with the slow duty cycle setting of PWM on the RP2040. There's a PR out for that um, based on some discussion in the forums. Uh, hug report to Anic Data and Naradoc for helping with the MDNS name mangling, debugging, and testing. Uh, hug report to Evil Dave 666 for fixing a creator ID issue they found when adding another one. And lastly, a hug to Lee Atkinson24 for uh, the analog buff IO. Uh, module that I revised uh, last week. All right, thanks. And finally, mm -hmm. I have notes for Tectric, who has a hug report for me for helping him out with uh, Adabot and for a great conversation last week to learn more about Mastodon, uh, and to Naradoc for pinging him about a neat issue with dependencies. Always enjoy digging around in the packaging world again. And that is hug reports. Next up is status updates. Uh, this will go basically the same way as um, hug reports. However, this is an opportunity to sync up on what we've been up to since the last meeting and what we're going to be up to until the next meeting. Uh, so take a couple minutes, talk about uh, what's going on with you. And uh, this is also an opportunity to provide tips and tricks. If anybody's got quick questions, uh, folks can answer. And if it turns into something longer, we can always move it to in the weeds. Uh, with that, I will get started. Uh, my list is pretty short. Um, last week, I put a Mastodon API intro guide into moderation. I moderated Liz's latest guide and updated the Feather RP2040 guide to reflect the latest version, which now has a user controllable button. Um, the boot button is now connected to GPIO4, and um, it is a right angle button, so Feather wings don't block it. Um, this week, I'll be working on the iSpy breakout guide with Liz. Um, and then uh, I have a project guide, which is an event countdown timer display using quad alphanumeric, um, three quad alphanumeric displays uh, to scroll text. So uh, that is sitting on my desk and looks excellent in the new stand. All right, that's me. Um, next, I will read C. Grover, who is text only. Uh, was heads down working on a friend's vintage guitar pedal restoration for the last two weeks. Reverse engineered the capacitor leakage damaged PCB to help with component location, not to remanufacture the board yet. Had to treat the pedal with great respect since the Bucket Brigade chip set components are no longer available. And yes, the project involved CircuitPython for the 809833 programmable waveform generator used for the audio tone and sweep tests. And a link to that code, I think, is in uh, the note stock. Developed a proof of concept wrapper class. Is that a thing that wraps a layer around displayio.palette object to make it respond to typical list slice syntax? Imagining all sorts of psychedelic image surgery of bitmap images as a result. And finally, snow, shoveling lots of snow. 
Next up is Dan. Okay. Um, in the past week, I've been following up on and trying to reproduce a number of issues of 800 issues. Some of them are not reproducible. Uh, some of them I'm not sure about. So I didn't actually solve that many issues, but I'm investigating a whole bunch. I reviewed and tested a bunch of other people's PRs. Not all of them had to do with the core, but their like HTTP server, as I mentioned. And I, as I, so I, I oversaw and debugged some HTTP server issues. That kind of overlaps with what I just said. Uh, I, I just tried a little thing. We have, we're having a trouble with PicoW startups and uh, on certain samples of the PicoW. So I just stuck a delay in somewhere and had the people for whom it was a problem try it. And it worked for them. And Jeff and I are still scratching our heads about this. But we did discuss it in the internal meeting before this. And I'm going to start to work on beta 5 release notes. Uh, we have a bunch of things that can go in beta 5 and a bunch of things that can go in beta 6. We'll probably just go ahead and do a beta 5 and do a beta 6 sooner. Though we always say that and we don't always do it. So, uh, but we need to catch up. We're behind with zillions of PRs that we should put out there in a beta. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Next up, I have notes from DJ Devin 3. Uh, received PCBs of my QtPy parent BFF. It's apparently useful for LED projects that need a lot of grounds. I will be using it in my Dragon Mask to make existing wiring much smaller. I have extras if anybody wants one. And there is a picture of that in the notes. Started assembling and packaging kits for TR cowbells to give away for beta testing. Found some serious hardware design flaws after more testing. I routed things in a way where all I2C buses are being used. Should still function as intended. If people want to add a display or other peripherals, they'll have to use uh, SPI only. Started designing uh, Cowbell version 1.3, hopefully ensuring I2C expansion and STEMA will work. Made a YouTube video on upgrading the battery in a HyperX Cloud Flight wireless headset from 100 and, or 1500 milliamp hours to 1800 milliamp hours. It requires a three-wire thermistor type battery that I couldn't find in the U.S. Had to get it from China. It took a month to arrive, and the upgrade process was a success. Next up is Foamy Guy. Right. Uh, last week, I finished up a couple of changes in the core uh, with the Pixel Map um, new core module, as well as the Display.io APIs. Um, I resolved the issues that were reported in the Python layer for the pixel map, so the Python code that makes use of that new core module. Um, I started working on updating uh, Blinka Display.io APIs to match the new core APIs, uh, but I found that I ran into issues uh, trying to use Blinka Display.io in the way that I was using it, which is with Pygame, um, kind of not necessarily how it's meant to work. But I ended up troubleshooting that and figuring out how to get it back to working in my environment um, and ended up spending uh, most of the time on that instead of actually changing the API like I sat down to do. Um, for this week, though, I do want to get back into that and actually change the API to match the new core one, because we do want to match over there on the Blinka land. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, this morning I've been uh, doing PR reviews and testing. A uh, big one that I was looking over this morning was for the WizNet library that handles Ethernet um, connections. And I got the hardware out, and we'll do some testing on that later on this afternoon as well. Um, some other stuff in my mind for this week, I want to try to come up with the easiest way to combine matrix portal projects, um, or, or really theoretically any of the portal based projects. I've seen folks come on discord a few times, um, who are like, not necessarily brand new. They've, they've gotten their, their matrix portal or whatever device it is, you know, mag tag or whatever, they've gotten it out. They've hooked it up. They've done some projects. They've seen some cool stuff and they can switch between them, but they want to like make it to where they can have one uh you know one code pie that does multiple projects basically maybe they switch it with buttons or maybe it bounces back and forth on its own after a few seconds or whatever um i'm not aware of any examples that are quite like that if anybody knows of one uh point me towards it but i'm gonna try to come up with the best way to do that and uh, just have something that we can show people that will hopefully explain the general approach for how to do it and and a couple of specific examples with some of those um, sort of beginner level matrix portal projects and trying to combine them together. A um, few other things uh, that I'll be getting into are uh, adding pixel map uh, to the bundle that pixel map library is created. 
uh, it's all spun up and got all of its stuff in, but it does need to be added to the bundle still, so I'll make that PR this week. And then uh, in project ideas, I'm thinking about trying to make a, a menorah on the Matrix portal uh, and continuing with the Matrix portal theme. So I'm going to plan out and maybe try a few different ways to animate some little flames uh, on the Matrix portal display and see if I can get something that looks nice for that. So that's what I have going on. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Tim. All right, next up is Jeff. Hello. Uh, first of all, a belated hug report to C. Grover for working on this cool palette stuff. I am excited to see that come to fruition. Should make for some fun little projects. Anyway, as to what I'm up to, uh, I worked on this .env replacement. I'll continue that this week. And in a bit down in the weeds, mm -hmm. I will tell you what's going on with that if you haven't been following the PRs. Uh, other GitHub pull requests activity. I opened a draft pull request for a future product called the Adafruit Think Inc. RP2040. It's a little kind of um, trinky style board that has a ribbon connector for uh, e-ink displays. It should be cool. I added socketpool.gai error so that when you are using sockets and you get an error, you can tell whether it has to do with resolving the host name or not. That's compatible with a uh, standard Python socket module. I wrote a PR called Ensure Orderly Shutdown of SSL Socket, and after talking it through with Dan, I think there's just one little cleanup to do, and then we will merge that. I also need to test whether there's um, a different way to cause the crash that was originally reported. This fixes a user reported hard fault. Uh, whether there's another way to reproduce it that doesn't involve um, the shutdown of the whole Python interpreter, and that will confirm that kind of my understanding and Dan's understanding of what is going on is accurate and satisfy us as to what the root, root, root cause really is. Um, uh, let's see, there are some other items in the um, in the document. I'm not going to read them all off. Uh, the other one that I fixed was uh, there were some problems with SD card I.O. on the SAMD family microcontrollers where it would um, say that your pins were in use when they should not have been in use. Um, so I fixed that and I tested it and confirmed that the Adafruit SDIO breakout works with the Grand Central M4. I reviewed and accepted some other PRs, including the PyCow access point from a community member. And so my work this week is to complete the next keyboard guide. I have text that I need to write. I need to complete the wiring for the version that I'm going to photograph in the guide and then make those photos. Uh, and then after that, it's returning to work on the .env replacement. And that's what I got. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Next up is Melissa. Hello. Uh, so this last week, I worked on uh, rewriting the USB workflow, or I actually continued doing that, uh, to use the file system access API uh, to be able to select a working folder. And then I have a PRN for that. Um, I fixed an, I also fixed an issue with the USB web serial connection locking up on disconnect, so it doesn't do that anymore. And I helped with adding boards to Blinka and onto circuitpython.org. And this week I'm gonna I'm working on improving the overall connections uh, workflow when there are multiple steps. So like if somebody like connects to serial but doesn't select a file system, then so it'll handle stuff like that better. Um and then I'm working on improving the BLE workflow after that. And that's it. Thanks, Melissa. Next up, I have notes from Tammy Makes Things. Last week, super busy with work and holidays, but did some work on a digital Christmas ornament, a gift for a coworker, and on my attempts to add NRPM message support to Adafruit MIDI. This week, hoping to continue to make progress on these things, despite the fact that we're doing performance reviews at work, and I'm missing this week's CircuitPython meeting for a three hour performance review calibration session. Other had to get new tires on my car because of a huge nail on the freeway, and I was pleasantly surprised when my car stereo noticed the drop in tire pressure and showed me an alert with a screen displaying all four tires, all four tire pressures from the TPMS sensors. This gave me an, enough warning to get to a safe place before the tire went flat. I'm curious now to look into how TPMS works because that was really cool. Next up is Scott. Hello. Um, I fixed uh, an issue with the ESP32 S3's deep sleep, um, which has been a long-standing bug that we thought was an espresso problem, and it turned out to be because we uh, 
don't use their build system. There's a weird build flag that we needed, linking flag that we needed. Um, so I found that and fixed it. There is a report that it's not working for somebody, but I'm going to take a look at that because I, I was testing it and it seemed to be working okay for me. So I'll take a look at what's going on the, with them. Um, I also fixed the MDNS name mangling issue. This was uh, the Espressif MDNS code tries to make sure that the host name is unique. Um, like MDNS can have a way of like seeing if anybody else has the same host name. Um, but it's not not really designed to work when we have two host names that we're dealing with. One that's unique like we have and then one that's shared. Um, so I improved their MDNS code to make sure it only mangled the right thing. Um, although it doesn't actually mangle the, the thing that collides. But anyway, it, it works, I think, better for CircuitPython. Uh, and I opened an issue on their stuff. I also re re reworked the... Oh, I, I copied it as audio buff IO. It's analog buff IO, um, which is a an API for getting a whole bunch of analogs, uh, an analog samples in a row. Um, <clears throat> not really meant to do in into audio or anything, but um, you can set like how many samples you want and how long. Um, I reworked it a little bit to like the buffer was being passed into the constructor, and I moved it to pass it into the read function, and I renamed that and stuff. So uh, that'll come in the next beta. Um, you can now control C it as well if you like it's really slow it down. Um, and now I'm starting to redo the coprocessor API. I've sketched out. Uh, a memory map module, which will allow for uh, just like r raw read-write access to particular regions of memory. Um, and that's important for writing to the memory that the uh, ultra low power processor on the S2 and 3 uses. Um, and then I'm going to look at the coprocessor API as well. I haven't like fully decided what that API is going to be. I don't think I was just looking at the RB2040, and I think it needs to, it may need to be something more custom. Um, I'm not entirely sure yet what that API will be. So it might, I might switch it from a generic coproc API to a specific ESP ULP API, maybe. That sounds better to me already. <laughs> um, and then I am starting to travel for the holidays next Wednesday, so I'm trying to do any urgent stuff that comes before that. I will be working some and uh, will have some stuff with me, but not nearly as much as I have here uh, at my home office. Um, so if you have anything that you think is urgent for me, please let me know. Um, and then in non-CircuitPython stuff, I'm, I did a Google takeout of, we have two Nest cameras now that we're running in the house. Um, one to watch uh, Ari, who is my, my kiddo, um, and then one in the, yeah, one in his, his crib and one downstairs. And I decided to just download all of it to see, um, which turns out to be about 700 gigs of MP, MP4 video from the last two months of, of all that. So that's been interesting. And I'm really glad I have fiber internet. Um, I can download a 50 gig file in like 10 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes, which is amazing. Um, and I have a Python script that I'm using to hash all the files before I squirrel them away. So hashing them, keeping track of how big they are, and storing that in a SQLite database. Um, and I want to do that also because I, I want to get metadata from Google Photos and be able to know like which file, which photos do I have locally, which photos do I have in Google Photos because they're automatically backed up that I need to download and all that stuff. Um, so that's not circuit Python things, and then. <clears throat> talking a bit more about uh, what I'm doing uh, kind of once I'm in Michigan, which is where I'm going for the holidays. Uh, I want to kind of get the STM32 G0 STEM QT tooling kind of all the way there, meaning uh, we can like load code and, and have a template repository for creating code that runs on a STEM QT device, probably acting as like an IO expander or I was also thinking, thinking it'd be cool to have a a program on the G0 that was literally just a, like a memory access thing. So you could, uh, in the same way that memory map allows you particular access to, to stuff, you'd be able to do that over I2C and basically write Python code that is very slow, but is act like actually interacting with anything on the other chip, which would be kind of neat. 
Um, Dan and I talked about doing using a CircuitPython device and, and PyOCD for a DIY SW JTAG in a pinch sort of thing. So, uh, for example, if you have an old NRF board that has a bootloader that can't update itself, this would be a way for us to kind of walk people through using any of our boards that run CircuitPython to just like in one time just just get it flashed. Um, PyOCD Pio makes that really easy. They use a plugin system, which is really handy. And then I'm going to look some more into the logic analyzer software world, uh, because one thing that I've wanted to do for a long time is a basic logic analyzer as well. Um, and I'm kind of brainstorming a, a feather wing that would be like a combo SWD JTAG and uh, a basic logic analyzer just for like really simple debugging, like I squared C and spy and stuff. Um, yep, so this is the last full week of work at home, and I'll be around off and on over the holidays. Um, and that's it for me. Thanks, Scott. Mm -hmm. Finally, I have notes from Tectric. This is last week. Final touches on the PyPI stats reporting for libraries in Blinka. All the bugs should be worked out, but I've said that before. Happy shrug emoji. Working through many of the issues regarding li typing and library infrastructure in my to-do list and going through a small backlog of PR reviews. This week, getting more information about the PyLint update for the Learn Guide repository, starting to fix the warnings in the GitHub Actions, uh, or that GitHub Actions is raising about deprecation. And in personal news, finished my last lab for my grad course for an embedded systems course. Thank you to everyone in this community for helping me to learn enough that programming the Arduino and this course in general has been relatively pain-free. Took and passed the Arduino certification test, though I'm still confident in my ability to conjure blue smoke when using one, and learning and practicing my C skills by doing the advent of code in C this year. It makes me appreciate Python, MicroPython, and CircuitPython so much more. And that is status updates, which brings us to In the Weeds. In the Weeds is an opportunity for more long-form discussions, um, or discussions that just didn't fit in uh, status updates. Um, if you have a topic, please post it while other people are talking. Otherwise, uh, once we get through the four listed here, uh, we'll wrap up. So uh, I will call on each person to talk about their topic. So first up is me. Um, the new Feather RP2040 revision now has a user controllable button on it. Um, obviously, there are far more of the previous revision in the wild than the new version yet. And all those original versions will be in the wild for a long time. So how do we handle adding board.button to the Feather RP2040 circuit Python pin definition? I, I basically got real excited about doing this and then it hit me that it doesn't work on, you know, a bunch of, um, is, is there a new board def? There isn't a new board def. It's the same product number, right? Yeah. It's just, it's a revision of the same product. We won't ever be selling them again with a flat button that isn't user controllable. Maybe we should make a new definition that's no button. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I know. That's, that's, I gave it a lot of thought and I don't, I don't have a conclusion either. I, I think that that's sort of, I mean, in the download, uh, Maybe we should, maybe we should, in circuitpython.org, maybe we should have a Feather RP2040 no GPI04 button or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it's a different color, right? Uh, yes, it is black again. Right. So the, so that could also be, so I think, like, I, w I, I think it sounds kind of good to me to, rather than have a with button, or maybe we should just have like, let's see, what's the color of the other one? Or the other ones could be pink or something, right? Or black, yeah. So I think changing the name of the old one makes sense to me, but I don't, because I, it kind of I agree. makes it have. Because it seems weird to have a weird named one for every board moving forward. Yes, yes. Don't change IDs. Like you could you could rename it in, on the website, but the the like actual name of the board should be the same. Doesn't it? Doesn't the build have its 
have its own name or does the build pull from the board name? Mm, inside, yeah, inside, inside. Mm, Do you yes. understand what the, I'm asking? So I'm, I'm saying that we can copy the old one, call it no button, and then edit the regular one and don't give it a new name. No. Why not? Because the because that changes the experience for the people that have the old one. They need to know that the name of their thing changed. Huh. Right? Like, you, it's an ID. It shouldn't mean something else in the future. Like, I would just call, it, new... just call it V2 or, or Rev whatever. Yeah. If it has a Rev, does it have a Rev on it? Yeah. It's got to have a Rev. I, I just I just got one. I think it's D. But no, I it's got a it's got a D on it. I guess that would not be a terrible way to go because people can actually look at the board and see the right. in the circle. We had a, we at one point we had a rev B for like Metro M4s or something like that. Mhm. Mm that board went through several, but we didn't sell nearly as many of the other of the old so, ones. Something Scott mentioned, uh, tickled. Um, is it possible to, uh, okay, rename everything on CircuitPython.org, like for that board? Like it'll still be the same. The, the build or whatever will still be the same. So the background stuff will still be the same. And then have, like, don't include RevD in the name on circuitpython.org for the new one, but have the build say RevD in it um, so that it's different, right? Yeah. Was that I have what you were suggesting, I, Scott? I, I, yeah. Okay. I had, yeah, that's what I'm saying is, like, the ID should stay the same, but if you want to, like have like in in the in the human readable version in both you could say like this button or that button yeah okay um, um style i don't mind that at all yeah. i have another idea okay which is why don't we call the name of the button rev d button but how does that then people without the um button can still put in board dot rev d button yeah, but they will say, like, why is it called Rev D button? But they also, they both have buttons. They both have boot buttons, yeah. But the difference is one of yeah. them is connected to GPIO and the other is not. And I don't think calling it Rev D button makes sense because right. A, it won't work with existing code, which a lot of things do. Um, and B, like, people will still try to use it and it'll do nothing. So. Okay. I think changing it to something weird in the in the existing build is probably not the best way to go. Right. I don't suppose we can detect when CircuitPython starts whether the button is hooked up in that way or not. Mm. I mean, I'm pretty sure the answer is no. And anyway, we can't. We don't have a way to change the content of the Board pins, yeah. the microcontroller, uh, to, to change the content of the pins. Yeah, uh, modules. So that doesn't help. Forget it. Um, so Scott, are you okay with us or me? Um, creating the second board def, calling that one something different in Circuit Python Core, and then changing up the name of the existing one on CircuitPython.org, like visually. Yeah, I would. I would change both. I would. I would have because you're going to want to make it clear what the difference between the two is. Do you okay. want them to have a different, different uh, UI uh, PIDs, USB? Uh, I mean, that would probably be best. Um, I mean, they're cheap, so right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I don't see why not. Okay, I will need help with that, but because I've not done that before, but I'm happy to learn. Can we? Oh, uh -huh. oh okay. uh -huh. now I understand. Well, I, I just, I was like, what? I don't get it. The boot button is connected G to GPIO 4 as well. 
no. on the new ones only. Right. Before it was just the boot button. That was the very first RP2040 board that she made, and she didn't connect the boot button on that one. Right. And but the, the, she put a diode in. I so see. that it can still control the flash. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's still a boot button. It just also is available in code, just like it is on the cutie pie, just like it is on whatever. Like, it's, right. it's the same on all the other RP2040 boards. Oh, right. It's the trick that the Pimeroni people did mm -hmm. after we did this first board. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd just add a new board def and call it ref D. And... OK. And in the text of both boards on circuitpython.org, we should say, like, if it's if your boot button is angled this way. Yeah. And you have a rev D on there. Then... I mean, there will be a rev E maybe at some point, too, so which might have no changes. Yeah. So I'm trying to think of a better name than rev D, but I don't know. I'll think of I would just call it rev D and assume that people understand ordering. Yeah. And then you want new PID, VID, or whatever it is that changes? Yeah, PID. Okay, got it. All right. Yeah, VID is know. vendor ID. So it's yeah, okay. okay, okay, okay. That stays the same. Got it. Yeah, Dan can show you how to do that, or I can show you how to do that. Keen. Um, I already changed the um, board def to include the button, but I didn't get any further with anything, so. Cool. It's not like PR or anything, it's just local, but okay. Thanks. Uh, the next topic is by Jeff. Right, so I was going to talk about this .env thing, and after I get done talking, I will uh, paste links to a couple of issues and to my branch. Uh, but basically, uh, kind of collectively, we identified that there were some things we didn't really like about the .env. Um, some of those things were the file name is difficult for a lot of people, especially on Mac, to access at all. It, it's a pain to access hidden files in this way. Um, the .env, there are like packages for .env for several different programming environments, and they all get the quoting and the syntax a little bit different. And so we felt it wasn't quite standard enough. And also it's very different from the way that uh, quoted strings are written in Python. Uh, so we went around for a while in a couple of uh, meetings and we've decided and documented on one of the issues that what we're gonna do is implement a subset of the TOML configuration language which is similar to any files. If you know those, that's INI, initialization files. ANY files would be something else. Anyway, so the new file is going to be called settings.toml. And to get values out of that, you will use os.getenv, uh, which does work today with .env. It's one of the two ways to get it. That will be the, the one preferred way to do it once we switch to settings.toml. And uh, we're implementing a subset of the file format. So you'll be able to read strings and numbers from what is called the global table, which is just the part at the top of the file. This leaves it open that we could later add a maybe implemented in Python full TOML parser, but that would be for the future. Uh, anyway, and then in the notes document, it shows an example of what it would look like to set your Wi-Fi SSID and password. And of course, we will do our best to update all the guides and docs uh, to reflect this. Due to the timing of things, this is probably not going to be in the next beta, but the beta after that. And um, yeah, so that's kind of an overview of what's going on. And if anybody has questions, I'll answer them. Otherwise, I'll mute and go find those links for the chat. I guess it's LinkedIn. All right. Time. Thank you. All right. Scott, you have the next topic. Ooh, thank you. Um, so, uh, Dan, Jeff, and I were just talking, going through 8.0 issues and realizing that uh, I think what's going to happen is that we're going to do 8.0 betas throughout the holidays, and then uh, we'll expe expect a release candidate in January uh, for 8.0, and then we'll get 8.0 stable in January. I just wanted to give a, he give a heads up for, for folks on that. Um, any other thoughts and opinions about 8.0? Okay. 
I just wanted to mention that then. Um, the next topic I have is thinking <laughs> about the new year. Um, we tend to start the new year with uh, posts about what we, what we think uh, CircuitPython should be or do for the coming year. Um, we ca we've called it CircuitPython 2022 and uh, next year is 2023. Um, usually I kick it off with a blog post on January 1st. Um, I just wanted to have an in the weeds topic for thoughts or things that we should do differently this year than we've done in previous years. Um, otherwise, it'll what what it was last year is like it's a kickoff post, and we get an email, uh, set up an email alias, and when people blog post about what they want, we'll then kind of like post them once a day or once a week, and we'll link to them and have a running list of all the the posts that people have done. Um, and then at the kind of the end of it, we'll have uh, like the final list of folks that have done CircuitPython uh, 2023 posts at the end of that. So that's typically what we do. Um, are there any thoughts or things that you'd like to see change for going into this next year? Um, I mean, I, th I think it's worked pretty well. So I'm I'm not really concerned about applying changes. Like, what I would say is, if um, anybody comes up with ideas between now and January first, uh, please let us know. Um, yeah. You know, if if there's some way you think it could go smoother, that sort of thing. Um, but otherwise, I think it's I think it works. Cool. All right. <laughs> that works for me because that's how we've done it before. So Excellent. now I got to decide what I'm going to write. <laughs> um, all right. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. This has been the CircuitPython weekly meeting for December 5th, 2022. Um, let me get to my thing. This uh, thank you to everyone who participated. If you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, and those of us that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing from Adafruit.com. Uh, the video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruit.daily.com to subscribe. The next meeting will be held next Monday as usual, I believe, at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Uh, this meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. To be notified about the meeting or any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the CircuitPythonistas role. Uh, we hope to see you all next week. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>